from my perspective, from the field work that I did, yeah, along that 1,200 kilometers, was an eye opener for me um, with regards to the things that we dug up as far as uh, um, environmental issues. I mean, I mean, there, there was that big coal-fired plant north of Atacokan um, that is now actually a, they use it like a like a biofuel. No, it's one of the um, one of the first in or the first in Canada, and they just converted them over the last two years. The green zones, which is a, which is behind the closed doors deal between um, hook and bullet operators in the uh, Ontario Natural Resources. What's a hook and bullet operator? Um, hunting, fishing uh, camps. Okay. Um, hook and bullet. Got it. They were complaining that that Americans were coming up and with fully supplied, fully outfitted they would compete for the resource, right? The fishing, okay. hunting, whatever. Yeah. So the government instituted this green zone. It's a massive area where you can't, I can camp, but if, I'm a, if I have clients from Europe or the United States, they can't camp anywhere in, within this green zone. We're forced to stay at a bona fide tourist, huh. uh, tourist lodge. So what was the result of this? Well, we took it. I took it up. I mentioned this yeah, to in, uh, our first meetings with the Transcanada Trail. I said, "Well, we got a problem here because we've got all these young people coming out of like, like uh, um, college, university, with degrees in outdoor ed, yeah. wanting to get into the business. Uh, maybe they want to be outfitters. They want to take kayak trips, canoe trips, SUP trips, and they have clients. M- most of our clients who use the backcountry in this country are from out of the country, the United States mm-hmm. and Europe. But they're being shut down by the green zone. But they can't camp." In this in this huge area, northwest Ontario, because of the green zones. Who made the green zone? That's a, that's a deal between the natural resources and the operators. And I took this up to Gordon when he was the environment commissioner. I said, "Have you ever heard of the green zones?" He said, well, Gordon, "What's Gordon that?" Miller. Gordon Miller. When he was the environment commissioner for Ontario, he said, "I've never heard of the green zones. I haven't heard of the green zones." And I said to the natural resources, "Well, this would never have flo- flown in northeast Ontario." I said, "We would have we would have jumped on this immediately." How did you guys get this passed? And of course, talking about the natural resources as well, it's to protect the resource. It has nothing to do with the resource. Why don't they stop building roads into the remote areas? You know, roadless wilderness, and then uh, protect your resource in, in, that, in that way. And then you won't have all these guys driving their campers up on these back roads, camping and competing for the resource. Yeah, we're wonderful in hindsight. I remember talking to an MNR, uh, Ministry of Natural Resources representative, and, and him saying to me, you know, the truth is, if we'd known, if we'd had the foresight to think about what an ATV, an all-terrain vehicle, could actually do, we never would have allowed it for hunting. Because what happens? The fat cat from the city comes up, who normally wouldn't make it 100 yards. He can hop on an ATV and go many, many, many miles back to where there's moose or bear or what have you, hunt, take, extract the animal out. So now there's heavy pressure hunting wise, all because of an all-terrain vehicle. Now, how does it get back that far? Well, logging roads that were, that were left and, and sure you can, they can bulldoze a logging road. They can create those little holes so a car can't drive, but an ATV can still do it. You know, they just didn't have that foresight of knowing what, machinery like an ATV could actually do. Well, even beyond that, I mean, we, in, in Tomogamy, we, uh, we had to be on the lookout for not just ATVs, but, the, you know, the logging cuts that were endorsed by the Ministry of Natural Resources were conscribed by logging companies specifically into areas, remote areas that were adjacent to remote lakes. And because of that, because a lot of the workers are average guys, or a lot of them are French speaking, when they're not working, they're recreating. And the big push was to increase the, the number of areas where they could get in and fish and hunt. This was also endorsed by the uh, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Um, and they had this uh, access is our right sort of mantra that they flashed around that, well, if taxpayer money goes into building logging roads then we have every right to access these remote areas. So it was a problem. And I remember in Tomogamy when I was a park ranger there, even, even the uh, conservation officers were afraid to go in to these, these gated roads because the locals said that they would, you build a gate, we'll tear it down. And we'll be waiting for you guys. You know? And so there was a lot of uh, intimidation. And, <clears throat> and there were you know, long distances for the conservation um, officers to drive to get there. 
So it wasn't maintained. It wasn't monitored. So you get all these logging roads being built. And from the logging roads, they'll, it's easy. It takes an hour for a skitter to plow a road 200 meters into a, into a remote lake. And they'll fish it out very quickly. And I remember doing a study, uh, sitting on a, a provincial group. Um, I could access some of the files that uh, actually nobody really knew about when I, because I, was a, I worked as a park ranger. I was in the park, Lands and Parks Division in Tomogamy. And, and I went into and I said, look, I want to take a look at um, uh, specific files having to do with access. And I wanted to make um, a comparison between what was the success rate for um, big game hunting, for example, when a road was being when a road was built, mm -hmm. you know, for logging purposes. So I looked at uh, the major all the major roads going into wilderness areas that were built, and looking at the success rate for for the moose and the bear hunt, unbelievable for the first year, huge number of animals taken out. Second year, it it dropped significantly. Third, fourth, fifth year, nothing, zero. So you can see when, I, when as they build roads, the depletion of that particular resource. Yeah, it's, and, not, it's not rocket science. It's going well, it on. But you know, um, to give credit to to the Ministry of Natural Resources, they have great information, but they don't apply it to anything. Right. And that's the, that, the, that wherein lies the problem. A friend of mine has been uh, researching. In fact, he's written many books about it called Missing Four One One. He's researching missing peoples in the national park systems. He's an, actually an ex-cop, so he understands statistics. He understands keeping logbooks and numbers. And, and when, when he went in, he found that they had no database of missing persons. This is the National Park Service of the United States of America, and they say they have no database of people who've gone missing. And yet, if you research by media, it's into the thousands, thousands of people inexplainably gone missing in the national park system and the national parks who have search and rescue teams and all this stuff and activity that goes on whenever one person goes missing is not keeping a database. Well, that's interesting. That's, that's was the basis for one of my books uh, on the Missanabe river was that um, my wife and I actually paddled over the body of a, of a, of a canoeist on the Missanabe river. We didn't understand it at the time. We didn't know anything about it, but we did see a search and rescue team on the side thinking it was just, a routine operation. We didn't know until a few days later when we got out and the you know, men had drowned in the rapids. So and I was scoping the river out for client trips. And uh, so I investigated and I actually ended up at the uh, coroner's office in Toronto and found out that there was 35 deaths on that one river, one Canadian river, 35 deaths. So I looked at all the topographic maps and noticed that, well, there's a lot of mistakes on here. There's there's rapids not marked on, there's falls marked in the wrong place, portage is marked on the wrong sides of the river. Right, which is, as you and I know, the concept of a portage, which is your route around a waterfall or a set of rapids, being on the wrong side of the river could be deadly. The consequences could be absolutely deadly. I approach every set of rapids and waterfalls if I know I can't travel it, with incredible trepidation in terms of, am I on the right side of the river? Am I gonna get the top of the portage? Is this the right place to go? So you're right, if there's actual ministry or, or official maps and they've got portages on the wrong side of the river and, and things labeled wrong, that could be that could be a deadly moment. Well, that's a, that's a trouble because Americans and, and Europeans come to this country thinking that we've got our, you know, our act together as far as cartography goes. So the most readily available you know, resource is the topographic map. And when you look at Canada, most of the most of the updates are done within that small range of territory above the, the national border where all the population is. So above that, you've got this wilderness zone, the white maps, the white maps that, that don't get updated for fifth, like a half day, like a half century. So you have out of country people coming in using these maps, which are which were not designed for recreation for canoeing recreation in particular. And they're thinking, well, if there's portage is marked on that side, well, we have to get there to get to the portage. Thunderhouse Falls, uh, five people died at Thunderhouse Falls, for example, is a good example. Yeah. I paddled just two weeks after two guys from Ohio died on that, on that. And I tracked down the cartographers that worked on that on that that map, that white map. Mm -hmm. Ontario Hydro wanted to build a dam at that location. It's just it's it's a spiritual site yeah, for the for the First Nations for the place, for yeah. both the Cree and and the Ojibwe people. They thought they would update the map. They marked the portage on the wrong side of the river in the 1970s, and of course, and in, in purple on a white map. So obviously, the portage has got to be there. 
it's, it's going to pop out at you, right? So five canoeists, two young guys uh, um, in their mid twenties, um, avid canoeists, and it's pretty hard for me because you know I had privy to this information, and to see two young guys stretched out on steel gurneys with their life jackets still on, bodies twisted, because a cartographer put yeah. the marked the portage on the wrong side of the map. Now this is this is uh, um, when you look at the duty of care for our, our provincial government. It's the same with the resources. They are not good stewards of our resources. And it's the same with, you know, when you look at the tourism, when we're enticing people, we're, pay, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on advertising to get people here. But it's like a product. If, if the product isn't safe, then, you know, you're liable for lack of duty. The of results. Care. Yeah. The re and, and the results were fatal. We, we, and when I looked, did my research, 17 of the 35 people who died on the Missanabe died because of faulty maps. And the government wasn't doing their homework. I'm doing a dance in my head between my questions to you earlier about, you know, how we reconcile the microcosm of environmental issues, you know, something going on in my backyard versus the, the larger thing. But you touched on it when we mentioned uh, an individual that we both know, David Suzuki. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, are we going to hell in a handbag? Uh, environmental activists, if they, if they have done their research and if they've done this long enough, they can have a fatalistic approach to things or be ap apocalyptic about it. It's tough to be in that position because you don't, people will lose faith in you as a spokesperson for the environment if you come on too heavily. This is the problem. This is how we can fix it. So we just have to find out ways of how are we going to fix this? And the solutions aren't, you know, they're, sometimes they're not tangible solutions. Sometimes they're not an easy fix. And sometimes it, it's, it's, it's just a political process that stands in the way or it's edu an, an educational thing where we need to, we need to reach out to the, the people who are going to make a difference, not just today, but, but 10, 20 years down the road. So you believe there are fixes? There are fixes. Whether we can do it fast enough, uh, it's hard to say. You know, I see these projections where we're going to cut down emissions you know, by the year 2050. But I'm thinking, that, that's a long way away. And we've got we to move a little faster than that. Have you heard population predictions ever? Because I've, yes. I've heard that, that we, is... will, we will hit around 12 billion and level off. That's what a, a predict, a recent... Well, I don't I have no idea who came up with that, but some, it's, you know, we're going to hit 12 million, 10 to 12 million, billion, and, uh, and that'll be it. We'll level off. Well, you know, scientists will also say that you put too many rats in a cage and they start eating each other. And <laughs> I think that's sad to think that we're going to start eating each other. <laughs> if you, we, I feel in my, you know, in my, in my opinion, my, maybe my ability as a, as an educator, from what I've seen in the field and within the mainstream movement is that things are moving way too slowly, not keeping up with the, with the speed in which uh, our resources are being depleted. Unfortunately, we keep try trying to drive up our standard of living. We want these things like everybody else. And it's, it's human nature to want these things. But we don't understand that as we drive up our... Um, standard of living, we compromise that quality of life. So as the standard of living goes up, quality of life is compromised in a lot of ways. So we, we got to find that balance somewhere. So if I were to ask you, as an artist, as a, as a multimedia artist, as a presenter, what would be the advice you could give me if I want to be effective in making a difference on how we're treating the planet? What would you, because you've been doing this for a long, you've been doing this longer than I have. My heart's been there, but you've been doing it, actually doing it a lot longer than I have. What would your advice to me be? Don't lose faith. Be, 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 be persistent. Um, the trends, the whole environmental movement, it's, it's an evolution of ideal, ideology, it's, and it's changing all the time. The way we do things, the way we, uh, I know, being, being actively involved as an activist, a social activist and an environmental activist, is that, and I think I didn't mention earlier that, that you know, we, we came out initially hugging trees. You know that emotional, psychological plea. Not only that, but to save you, things. you and your ilk at that time, you set in motion inadvertently an entire kickback of terminology. Tree huggers. Ah, here come the tree huggers. You started that because before what you did, what you did in those early seventies, late sixties, early seventies times, I, I don't think the term tree hugger existed. And then you guys kind of brought it into vogue, and then it got used against us because now it became bunch of pansy ass tree huggers well granola munching tree huggers yeah yeah i mean i mean 
You yeah, know. granola eating, we tree hugging. Same, we have the same words for the the brown side too. Yeah. You know, that we're both. I mean, and then you got the whole issue is, is convoluted when you get when we start throwing stones at the corporate bad guys. Yeah. You know, because then it gets pushed to each end of the spectrum. You get you get the radicals on both sides, and then and then it, you, you, then everybody loses sight. The media has a field day because they love this stuff because everybody's fighting, and there's blood. Down there, and that's what makes the news. So, I know in in my activities, we approach things wrong. We approach First Nations people wrong, because that's probably the imperialist uh, um, in me. I don't know. We you know we just assumed that they would be on our side, but I think we tried to on the environmental side. Well, yeah, and I, you know, talking with, say, the example, uh, Gary Potts, who I have great respect for, for the, tem- uh, the chief of the Temiog Anishinaabe people, oh, time in Tomogamy, he said, you know, we agree with you people, but we'll never, we'll, we'll always run on parallel lines, and that, that that made great sense to me. Mm-hmm. They had a totally different ideology about things than us white Europeans, for example, and I realized that. I said, y- you know, you're right. We fight for the same things, but maybe we fight for different reasons. We have to learn from the First Nations to dig a little deeper. Because let's face it, we've, and especially now, we've gotten pretty soft as a species because we keep pushing that standard of living up and up and up. But as we do that, we divorce ourselves from, from the natural world. I've had a perspective on that that I think is fairly strong. I've had it for a long time. And, I, and I, 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 when I was in Yellowknife is when I kind of saw it. I always thought that the environmentalists and the Aboriginal perspective indigenous cultures of Canada, when I would see or hear a statement such as, well, because I'm Aboriginal, I love the land, it would always get my blood up. Because I would say, look, you know what? I can lead you right now to a number of of wonderful, beautiful, nature-loving indigenous people that that I'm good friends with, and, and absolutely. And I can lead you to some polluting, cliche, stereotypical, racist white people and that are doing... But I can also lead you to a number of Aboriginal individuals that are friends of mine that I've, that could give a crap about the environment, that don't care, that want profit. And I can lead you to a whole bunch of white people who would rather die than destroy a valley. Yeah. So my point was... Love of nature is not genetic. No, exactly. I've had the same argument uh, with First Nations people. They say, you're white. How can you get close to nature? Kind of thing. That, that would, that would, that, get, riled, that would, when I asked you earlier, what gets your, your goat? Yeah, that's that would another boil one. Boy, my blood. That's, that is, is truly another one. I have seen places. I have traveled extensively by primitive means, as you know, and I have discovered things that have been lost um, up in up in the the tree line, the Arctic area, where I remember spending some time with the with the Denny and Tadouli, uh, northern northern Manitoba, and he said we don't get that far from from our village anymore. We don't do the Seal River; it's too dangerous for us. But we used to travel the Eskers, and we don't do that anymore. And then, and then you know, and they asked us in your travels, can you take a look at see if you can find these way markers that that have been lost to our people. Not only that, we found, I know doing my mapping in, in Manitoba over the, the five years I was there, we found dozens of, of archaeological sites that were lost to the, to, to the people mm-hmm. who made them because we've spent four centuries pulling all that stuff away from them, telling them to be more white, taking away their religion, their culture, their language. Residential schools, all of this. And it's sad. And I feel gifted. I, I remember being getting in trouble with the Archaeological Society in Manitoba. They almost threatened to take me to court because I wouldn't divulge the information I found about these archaeological sites. I said, well, this is, this is not your property. This belongs to the First Nations people. Of belongs to the, to the, to the Swampy Cree and the Soto Ojibwe and, and, the, and the Sayasi Denny people. I got in quite a conflict with... I'm an amateur archaeologist. But I find a lot of things out there that have been lost to the people. I make enemies along the way, not just in the industry, but in, in different societies, because I get out there. I don't ask for the glory for these things. I get out there to find these things so we don't lose them, so they don't build another dam and flood out you know, these, these uh, um, dolmen stones and these sacred sites for, for 
for the, for the people who were here long before us. You don't ask for the glory, and yet you do feel slightly incensed that other warriors are not getting some glory, getting some. Well, for their sake, I I feel guilty almost. I I have a notoriety. I have I've done these books, and my wife will say that. Well, you're you're too humble. You know, you're too you be proud of what you do. I'm proud of what I do, but I don't ask it, 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 anything in return. For you that. know, Hap, honestly, I've known you for a few years now. I don't know that if somebody asked me to describe Hap Wilson, I'd go, you know, he's a real humble guy. I don't think I would say that. Not because you're arrogant or because you're vain, but simply because I, I picture you as a very, I love your opinion. I love the fact that you have an opinion. My battle, one of my battles these days is getting people who have hidden opinions to express them. And you've always expressed your opinion. I respected you before I met you because I remember thinking, well, I've never met this dude, Hap Wilson, but, but I can tell by what's going on and the fact that you don't like him that I'm probably going to like him yeah. because you have an opinion. Well, it's interesting because as you say that, one of the most uh, humble people that I've ever met who had great opinions was Bill Mason. Yes. I did a talk in, in Ottawa. There were three of us and we were, I was representing the uh, adventure tourism uh, uh, industry. And then we had, there was a representative from the Temiagam Anishinaabe people. And there was a representative from the logging company. Anishinaabe got up and she spoke very eloquently about why we want to protect the land. And I got up and said, well, I had to speak. Um, I had to divorce myself from the real reason why I love wilderness, because there's this whole ecotourism, adventure tourism, opportunities for people to spend money in local communities for not you know, cutting the forest down. Yeah, so you're making logistical yeah. sense, uh, so, quantifying sense. Yeah, yeah so this, the guy from the logging company got up, and he showed a five-minute five, five minute video about extolling about all of the benefits of the industry does this and does that. You know, everybody's walking around with a Bible under one hand and a chainsaw on the other kind of thing. And it was pure propaganda. This one guy in an audience of about 500 people stood up, short man, white beard, tilly hat, and he reamed this guy out. He said, "You, this is the worst bit of propaganda bullshit I have seen in my lifetime. And the logging guy said to this man in the audience, says, well, sir, if you know anything about canoeing, you would know that we protect blah, blah, blah. And the whole audience knew who this, this was Bill Mason, right? He's the he was, patron saint <laughs> the patron of saint canoeing. Of canoeing. <clears throat> and uh, and he had no idea this was Bill Mason questioning his video. And he was laughed off the stage at that point. And it was one of those moments where, yes, there is a God up there somewhere looking down on us. Yeah. You know? See, I struggle with this. As Survivor Man, I have a voice. As an articulate speaker, I have a voice. I go out and I do keynotes and all that sort of stuff. And I might make a lucrative amount of money from the corporate situation, or I might go talk for free at, at, at a school group. One of my reasons for having you here today is very selfish because I'm trying to find my path with this voice of the wilderness gene. And Bill Mason, people, I, I, you know what? I saw a post recently and said, you know what? I was on a canoe trip with you back in 1987. And I remember you saying you wanted to be the next Bill Mason. And Bill died in 86, I think it was. And it's very true, you know? And that's, that's where I'm at now because mm, the compromiser in me doesn't want to ruffle too many feathers, but the realist in me knows I have no option if you really want to make a difference. I never wanted to be, I know people have pinned me as, as the next Bill Mason, but... I, do. I, would, I, I don't. Yeah, I say no, you're I'm a different Hap, man. I'm, than I'm Bill. Hap Wilson. I'm not Bill Mason. You're, I, I, you're Hap Bill Wilson. Mason was he was a, he was an incredible human being, and as I say, he was one of them. He was very humble. You know, he was famous in in his in his own day, but he didn't wear it on sleeve. Is what I'm saying. You know, he's a man that that has done a lot in his life. He has given us the gift of film and art. And if he, it'd be great if he was here with us sitting right here now and he would, you know, he would be uh, probably talking like, I, like we, we are now and uh, expressing his passion for protectionism 
for the environment through his art. That's a great observation. You see, I started this interview by asking you about, as artists, you know, how do we use our art to protect the environment? How are we using our art uh, to share and teach about the environment? And you're quite right. Bill Mason was one of the forefathers of doing that, or at least he was maybe not a forefather because maybe we need to give that to John Muir and, and Aldo Leopold and uh, Henry David Thoreau and so on. But, but Bill Mason in a, in a more modern sense with filmmaking, he took me there. If it wasn't for Bill Mason, I'm not sure Survivor Man would even exist because I was inspired by that. Yeah. It, uh, well, it's, it's interesting what's, what inspires us. I know as a youth, I was a voracious reader. We didn't have a lot of things on, on survival. We, I, I think I had one book, uh, in the library it was Bradford Angier's survive, surviving in, in the woods or something. And it was very basic. And then they were sort of, there was Boy Scout manuals and, and Lester Griswold's mm -hmm. camp craft kind of thing. And we didn't have a lot of, to, to sort of bank on as far as, as uh, information to, to guide us along. And I had dysfunctional parents, which actually forced me out of the house to, into, into the wilderness and to do what I'm doing now. Basically, I thank them for being dysfunctional in, in a way. But uh, what inspires us to, to do what we do? And like, like Bill Mason was, was inspirational for me. Um, Kirk Whipper, an, another. Uh, very inspirational because he, he was an orator. He, was, he had a gift of, of story. And that is an art in itself, too. And he could hold an audience. He could mesmerize an audience through his stories. Mm -hmm. I have never seen anybody that could equal him. If he can mesmerize an audience, then he can influence an audience. Uh, aside from Stuart McLean. Uh, there was Stuart. Yeah, Stuart McLean. Who had just lost. He yeah. was, yes. And a very humble person who had fame and who, again, didn't wear it on his sleeve. Like, um, yeah, that's, and it's... They come by naturally. I'll tell you, yeah. uh, Kurt, Whip, Kurt Whipper has actually a quote that I have often quoted him. I had uh, was fortunate to meet him. Uh, on a number of occasions and had lunch with him. And we were actually dealing with, dealing with a particular individual in the, in the film industry. And I said, hey, what do you think of, uh, what do you think of so-and-so? And Kirk, and you remember, Kirk was a big man with a broad chest, right? And he just, he just, he just sort of breathes in, right? He breathes in and he leans back and he looks at me and he just goes, success is made of sterner stuff. And I just thought, oh, that is... And we were talking about an individual who was talking out of both sides of his face. He was full of it. We knew it. And I, and I wasn't sure. And so I just wanted his opinion. And he just, that's all he said was success. He didn't tell me, here's what I think of so-and-so. He just said, success is made of sterner stuff. And, I, and that, that is all he needed to say. I knew exactly what he meant. And I've used it 20 times since then. It's been great. This uh, stylistically was based on a guy named Mississippi John Hurt when I was training and trying to learn his finger picking, lyrically was uh, just about being into monogamy. Actually, that's how I wrote this song. So, From my debut album, a song written in and about to monogamy Ontario. This is Free to Be. One, two, oops. One, two, three. <laughs> Wind is light, the sky is blue My heart is heavy when I don't have you And I miss you Like a posh land misses rain I camp on the land, a boat on the sea Life ain't life if you can't be free to live it You'll always find a way Forty hours of work week were never meant for me Lately I've been bitten by the bug that sets us free Wilderness wandering and ocean waves are calling Standing in a forest you can hear when trees are falling Oh, 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 oh this is free I 
little to the left, a little to the right, a lot in the middle, cause it feels so right just loving you. Neath the sun and neath the moon. Years they come, years they go. All I know is they all go by too soon. Don't waste your days away. Forty hours of work week were never meant for me. Lately I've been bitten by the bug that sets us free. Wilderness wandering and ocean waves are calling. Standing in a forest you can hear when trees are falling. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. Paddle that stove up in 1971 up to the old lumber camp in, on Diamond Lake. And we hit, we hit it in the bush. Oh, that lumber camp. Hit it in the bush. 1972, um, I had my appendix out a week before we were to get on the train and do a, an all-winter camp out. And had my appendix out and... Five days later, got on the train. Still had stitches in. Had uh, two toboggans. We had our guns strapped to the top. And uh, 150 pounds in our toboggans. I started walking from the train station. Got in front of Lakeland Airways. And I said, I'm, I can't do this. My stitches are going to come out. And uh, we looked at Lakeland. He had two planes on skis that, that time. He had a Cessna 180 and a Cub. I said, we got to see if we can fly in. So... Forty dollars it cost to, to hire them to fly us in with all our gear. Dropped us off at Diamond Lake. We pulled this stove out from the bush, set it up in the old log, logging camp cabin. Got a fire going. I was sick for about three or four days. I couldn't move, and my friend, he kept the fires going. He fed me, and until yeah. I got my health back from and my appendix had burst, so I was in bad shape to begin with. And I was unconscious on the floor. I was boarding down in, in, in north of Toronto. And uh, I was just about dead. And uh, had I been out there in the wilderness, would have been I would have been dead if my appendix had burst out there. I was, uh, somebody asked me, okay, I, got a, I, I was asked in an interview recently. They said, do you think that it's true what they're saying, that Democrats are starting to buy more guns and are starting to learn about prepping, being preppers, you know, being preppers, right? Is, is, um, uh, these are the people who have bunkers in the ground and stored up food for three years and stuff like that. And this was the question to me. And I said, yeah, I, I do think that's right. And, and the, the next part was, and if you think it's right, why? And I said, and I, my answer was because there is a general overall feeling of fear of what's going down. And, and that, yeah, so, so do you, what do you think it's just Republicans that have this fear? Do you think it's just Republicans that own a gun? It absolutely makes sense to me that Democrats are owning more guns and they're getting prepared for, you know, some sort of dark apocalyptic end of the world. And when I, I this was a, an interview I did by email. So I was, ans I was able to check and recheck my answers. You know, so I said, I'll tell you one thing. I said, if all rednecks, think tree huggers are pussies, they should step lightly. And I said that, honest to goodness, thinking of you. And I brought you up in the conversation. I was talking to someone about this interview that I did. And I said, you know, people think tree huggers are a bunch of pussies, a bunch of tree hugging hippie pussies. They have no idea what hornet's nest they're poking at. And that was my thought on today's current situation politically. I think this was all fun and games but there's a hornet's nest that's being poked here and hornets sting. And for example, there's a, a term right now being used for 
protests environmentalists. It's a snowflake. Hey, listen, snowflake. And so I'm sure that that sector of society thinks they're very cool and very funny, you know. But someone actually came back and said, you know, snowflakes become avalanches pretty quickly. I thought, yeah. And I thought about you. When I answered that interview, I thought about you. I thought, not all us tree huggers are pussies. Be careful. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, that's a good point because, uh, and even going back to the, to the Democrats buying guns, because I just heard in the news that uh, um, there are more people building fallout shelters now um, since the 1960s. I remember, I grew up in the 1960s, and, and my father had my brother and I scraping out a fallout shelter underneath our house at that time. And we're back in that era again. People are afraid. And they, they don't have to be Republicans or Democrats, but they just have to see the direction things are going in right now. On the other note, where us snowflakes, um, I mean, I've, I've been in the inside, I've had barroom brawls. And I've been, I'm, I mean, I'm a scrapper to begin with. But I was, you know, I've been in, um, involved in the, blo- in the blockades and what have you. And I've seen hippie women climbing 100-foot pine trees and, and camping out in pine trees for, you know, weeks at a time. And I don't think, you're, you're not going to get um, a clubber, redneck clubber, you know, leaving his camper um, and climbing up, up, up a pine tree 100 feet in the air. In late September, in Tomogamy, for example, and with just a blanket... Yeah, when it could snow any day. While loggers are down below were lighting fires and pretending to chainsaw the tree down at the same time. Mm-hmm. There's courage in that. Yeah, there's and a real toughness. Yeah, there is a toughness You're in that. You're seeing it in Standing Rock. Yeah. It's happening there. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you. Um, we're good. We're good. good. This is a great interview. We're done? Oh, yeah, we're done. Oh, look at that sunset out there. Little, little, nice. I know. Purpley mauve colors out there. Nice. Isn't like, this amazing? True story. Around a dozen years ago, or so, while Survivor Man was around the world on TV screens, Hap and I and our sons were on our way to a canoe trip in the waters of Tomogamy. We stopped in the outfitters in town for a few final supplies. At one point, I was left in the store with just the salesperson who knew me well and who knew Hap. She turns to me and says, Okay, something bizarre is going on with the universe. Les Stroud and Hap Wilson in my store at the same time going on a canoe trip together. The two greatest legends of Tomogamy. I think my head is going to explode. Well, legendary? Maybe in Hap's case, yes. But in both our minds, Hap and I, we really were, are, and will always be a couple of men very deeply passionate about nature, the spirit of the natural world, and of course, paddling a canoe on a glassy, remote lake in the mist of the morning, searching for that next portage trail to keep the journey going. This podcast is, as the saying used to go, brought to you by Aggressor Adventures. Choose your adventure. Surviving Life with Les Stroud is presented by the Apostrophe Podcast Network and is mixed by Keith Ullman. You're surviving life with me, Les Stroud. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Survivor Man Les Stroud, as I have hundreds of videos there and more going up every week. From Survivor Man Archive to Bigfoot to Wild Harvesting Tips to Urban Disaster Survival. It's all there and it's all free. My brand new series, Wild Harvest, featuring local foraging and turning those wild edibles into sumptuous dishes, is now on National Geographic Asia, PBS stations in the United States, and Cottage Life Television in Canada. This perhaps is the most incredible kitchen scenario I've ever had. This is gonna be delicious. When you start getting involved in local foraging and bringing the ingredients home and playing with them in the kitchen, can you create a dish where the domestic ingredients don't overshadow the wild ingredients? Chef, meet the plant. I'm bringing you right to where this fireweed and the horsetail and whatever else we find right to where it lives. Its life cycle is carried out here every single day of the year and you have the opportunity to meet it at its home. 
Oh, baby. Oh, go on. That's a lot of fun. It's like being a kid again. No matter where you live, right outside your door is a prolific and abundant wild harvest just waiting for you to enjoy it. Look at all these different colors. Come to Mama. I've never worked with lionfish before, and I know you have, so I'm hoping that I can learn a few things from you. Woohoo! Beautiful little rainbow. Dinner. I have to eat some along the way. It's gonna taste so good. When you're making something with a wild edible, you're nailing it and not losing the wild flavor. Sometimes it is about the ingredients. The brand new special, Surviving Disasters with Les Stroud, is now on a PBS station near you in the United States or on my YouTube channel. What the heck is going on? Oh! It felt apocalyptic. No radio, yeah. no TV. It happened almost instantly. No one was prepared for it. A lot of people just don't think it'll happen to me. It's basic human nature not to want to think about things that will scare us. If you wait until you need to be prepared for something, you're already too late. Anybody want to know what's like during the hurricane? And my brand new children's book, Wild Outside, written for your kids. It's all about getting your kids into the out of doors. And it's out now. Google it. I'm an easy find on Google for those and so much more that I produce during any given year, no matter what's happening on the world stage. We'll figure this life out together. Cue that rip and harmonica solo, Keith. <laughs>